Good morning and happy Monday. My name is Scott Myers. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at West Virginia University, and I am leading an NCA seminar titled Learning the Three C's, Becoming a Competent Classroom Communicator. Um, this week's session is going to talk uh, about a series of topics related ultimately to teaching effectiveness. And hopefully by the end of the week, or at the end of each session actually, you might get some, um, you might have, you might get a few ideas on what you can do in the classroom when we start teaching in the fall, um, or perhaps you'll get an idea for a research project or two. Um, I know as, as I was preparing for this, um, I was getting excited with a few of the topics. So I thought, oh, here would be something that would be interesting to study. And of course, I always remind myself of how I can do better while I'm teaching. Um, so for to give you a bit of a rundown of how it'll work is each day I'm gonna talk about 20 to 30 minutes about uh, the topic um, at hand. And then there was an accompanying list of um, readings and homework. Now, obviously none of this is mandatory. These things um, have been compiled for um, your use um, in case you would like to, to use them. Um, for the readings, each day I've selected five to six to tap into um, the content or the topic at hand. And so if you wanna read a little bit more about it, there is, there's the reading for that. Um, for each day, there's a couple of readings with an asterisk, and this is just something additional that if you want to go read, um, you certainly can do so. I did not include these as PDFs. I've only submitted the five per day, um, the, but those you can easily find, I think, at your library, or you can email me because I have most of them as a PDF that I can send to you. There's also a list of um, homework questions that really are reflections for you to just think about um, the topic that we've discussed and how you can apply it really to your teaching, because I think everything we're going to discuss this week um, has important ramifications for what you do. Um, and keep in mind too that, you know, it really doesn't matter how much teaching experience you have when we talk about these things. If you're brand new to teaching, some of these should help you become more effective in your teaching. If you've been teaching for a while like I am, uh, or I've been, I'm gonna, I think I'm starting my 33 year, 33rd year of teaching in the fall. Um, you know, it's always a good reminder of what you can or should probably think about doing. You know, sometimes we get a little complacent in our jobs. Sometimes we get bored with our jobs. Um, I'm sure with most of us, we've had to make, we all made the switch to online learning and online teaching, you know, sometime this past semester. And, you know, that in itself is an undertaking without having to worry then about some of these other behaviors, but they apply to online teaching as well. Um, so you can always use those in that case. Uh, so today, our topic is developing a sense of teaching effectiveness. And what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about first, um, what, what does it mean to be an effective teacher? And I want to discuss um, four trains of thought, four, you know, four opinions basically from the instructional communication literature um, on what teaching effectiveness is. And we know that that's a term that's hard to define um, and sometimes even harder to evaluate. And then after we discuss those, I'm gonna raise a couple of other minor issues, um, issues that inform our teaching that some of us don't think much about because they're not part of our traditional training as they're more pedagogic, um, pedagogically based. Um, and again, for some of us, we haven't had much training at all. I mean, if I think back to my graduate student days, I think with my MA, it was a week, but that included a bunch of different things. And PhD, I, I, we had a week long training at the university level, but again, um, you know, you don't necessarily remember all that stuff as you keep going. And unfortunately, not everything focuses on communication. And I think that's one th thread you'll see throughout these uh, five sessions is that really communication is the key uh, to being a competent classroom communicator. You can know your content, but obviously if you don't know how to communicate it, um, you're not gonna be as effective as you could. So um, let's start discussing what does it mean to be an effective instructor? Now, I'm an instructional communication researcher and there over the years has been quite a 
uh, you know, a substantial amount of research devoted to this question, not necessarily asking it as blatantly as what is effective teaching, but a lot of research has been conducted that um, has helped inform and answer this question. Now, when you look at that collective body of literature, I think there's four answers that stand out um, or four possible responses. And as we talk about these, I want you to also think about which one makes more sense to you. Um, I'm going to have a bias toward one or two of them, which I'll explain as I, as I talk. But um, there, I don't think there's a right answer per se. And certainly you could combine several of these responses into one. But I think this is one thing you have to think about when you enter the classroom, you know, partially is what are you there to do and how are you going to do it? Um, and we're going to talk a lot this week about the how part, you know, what you can do to, do the, to, to help you become more effective. Now, the first, um, I guess, response to what um, does it mean to be, effective, to be an effective instructor comes from Scott Nussbaum um, in a 1981 article in um, Communication Education. Um, and they say flat out, a teacher's effectiveness is fundamentally related to cognitive, affective, and behavioral domains of learning. And I mean, and I think at the most basic level, that is why we're in the classroom and that's how we should measure um, teacher effectiveness. Do our students learn something? Now, you know, we're not gonna get to the debate of how to measure learning or uh, what's the best way to measure learning. But what we wanna remember is that students um, experience three types of learning in the classroom. Now, depending on what you teach, you may not be able to tap into all three, um, <clears throat> but you should be able to or try to tap into at least two of the three. And all. Um, so the first one is cognitive learning, and I think most of us would agree that's the most important. Cognitive learning represents understanding. Have students retain the information? Can they do something with the information that we taught them? And that certainly is important. You know, we can't argue that. Then there's what we call behavioral learning, where students learn to do. There's something that they actually do. And not all of our comm classes necessarily lend itself to behavioral learning, but you can probably think of some tasks um, that do. And keep in mind, these three domains don't have to be divorced from one another. You know, a lot of times behavioral learning, people think of something like teaching a PE class, teaching a student to do a jumping jack. Well, obviously that's a behavior, uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, so when we think about some of our comps, it's how to give a speech. You know, there's a behavioral element to that, obviously, but there also is a lot of cognitive learning that complements that because otherwise um, the speech won't be effective. And then we have what we call affective learning. Um, and this is really the student's emotional res or the response to learning. Do they like what they're learning? Do they enjoy their learning experience? You know, I think it's really disheartening and some of you will agree with me on this is we occasionally or, you know, come across a student in our own classes that just doesn't want to be there. And it's beyond not wanting to be there because of the content. It's because they just don't have a, like, a love or a liking for learning. Somewhere along, they learn, somewhere along the way they've learned to dislike why they're in the classroom. And that's unfortunate. And as instructors, that's hard to um, obviously undo all of that. Uh, I want to say damage, that's too hard of a word or too, too strong of a term, but yeah, I think you know what I mean. We want our students to have affect. We want them to like learning because that's what keeps them going. Um, you know, and that's, and we're talking about learning outside the classroom as well. You know, so when we're teaching, the first, again, the first response to what means to be an effective teacher is that basically your students should be learning across the three domains of learn. Uh, your students should be learning something. Teaching effectiveness um, occurs when students cognitively, behaviorally, and affectively learn. All right, so that's our first response, and that's guided a lot of the research in instructional communication. Um, the second one is um, comes from an article that John Nussbaum wrote back in 1992. It's in an issue of communication education. It's actually one of my um, go-to articles when I teach a graduate course in instructional because it gives a great summary of what's been done up until that point. Now, obviously, it's a little dated but it's a good history of some of the articles that have been written. But um, he says, or he basically argues that effective instruction relates to, or, or it becomes those in-class behaviors of a teacher that are related directly either to positive student outcomes or positive evaluations of teaching. And this really is something that we do obviously, I think, think about, maybe not necessarily with that language, 
But the idea here is that our in-class behaviors, um, which we'll talk about more on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, are related directly either to positive student outcomes, such as learning, such as student motivation, such as student engagement, such as student uh, uh, participation. You, you could put a lot of different things in there, the establishment of uh, the perception of a supportive classroom climate or positive evaluations of teaching, you know, um, just basically the things that you're doing both um, communication wise, pedagogy wise in the classroom. Um, now, one problem sometimes individuals have with this particular response is that it really feeds into the process product paradigm of teaching, um, that if you do X, Y, and Z, positive outcomes are going to occur. And that certainly is true. I mean, that's a predominant um, paradigm through which most of us have learned how to teach and uh, certainly explains how we teach. Um, so there's really nothing wrong with that per se. But one thing we want to keep in mind is this, it, it, there's a pedagogy behind the use of many of these behaviors. You know, um, it's not just trying to engage in behavior X or Y, it's understanding why you're doing this, understanding how this behavior works, understanding the best way in which you can exemplify this behavior. So it's just not um, saying that you engage in behavior X and you're going to have a positive student outcome. Okay. But again, Nussbaum 1992 stating that our in-class behaviors, what we do in the classroom affects our students. Um, and it also affects the perceptions of what we do. Um, that's, so that's our second response. The third response is, is not a response per se, but um, it's a way of just identifying some of the general behaviors that teachers use um, in the classroom that students consider to be effective. And these are not necessarily communication, I'm sorry, these aren't necessarily instructional communication behaviors per se, um, but they're you know, along the lines of just general pedagogy, which makes sense. Um, Kramer and Peer published an article in 1999 in the Southern Communication Journal where they looked at teaching effectiveness in small and large classes. Now, they, in small class was operationalized as 25 students or less, and large was 50 students or more. And obviously, your notion of small versus large is going to be dependent on where you work. Um, in my department, a small class is, is going to be 40 and under. Um, a large class is, is usually around the 200 to 350 mark. Um, and then we have a couple in between, but not many. They tend to go into one of those two. Well, what they did with this one was they created, they asked students basically about behaviors. And they, this is a really interesting article. This is on one of ours that you can read. Um, it has, I think, good pedagogical value if you're teaching, teaching, um, because it comes up with some cool, I guess, um, categories of or classifications of teachers. And I think students, graduate students who read this can easily identify with, with the approach they take, which might help them with their own teaching. The same thing could be applied to you. But basically, they identified in small classes 10 behaviors that were deemed effective, and then in large classes, eight behaviors. Now, across the two classes, there are four behaviors that um, students identify as being effective. So these are something to consider. Um, so the first behavior was being energetic or enthusiastic. And that is something that we do see in the literature quite a bit. You have to have a level of dynamism. Um, and I think we all know that anecdotally or anyway, right? Who, who is interested in a dull teacher? But it's not always easy to be energetic or enthusiastic all the time. And um, certainly that's something you can't uh, fake, you know, because sooner or later students figure that out. The second is um, they like they like instructors, or, or I'm sorry, effective teachers are those who are casual slash approachable. And that is something we'll talk more about on Friday. I think um, one thing we have to remember in the classroom is we have to uh, use a communicator style that's going to invite students to talk to us uh, or to participate in class, which may not be a behavior that we use um, outside the classroom, a lot in our other relationships. Um, but we students like an approachable instructor. I mean, and I, again, I've been teaching for a while and that tends, I think that's been true over the last uh, 30 years that I've been teaching. Um, conversely, they don't like a dry or dull instructor. 
And I don't think a lot of us like to admit that we're dry or dull, but certainly some of us are. Uh, when I say some of us, I'm not talking about necessarily me or all of you who are watching, um, maybe, maybe our peers, right? But, you know, and sometimes we become dull or dry just out of habit or because of a lack of excitement about the topic. I mean, you know, some of us have taught the same course over and over and over, um, and that can become dull in itself. And it's easy to become complacent when you're teaching um, the same thing, the same class over and over and over. So we have to really work hard at not being dull or dry. And then the last one um, was that they want, or that they judge effective instruction by teachers who develop an effect, I'm sorry, a comfortable climate. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about climate, I think tomorrow, um, in terms of just creating an environment where students feel that their contributions are valued or welcomed um, and that they're not put on the defensive. And I think, again, a lot of us know from past experience that, you know, you may have days that are a little bit defensive, but you certainly don't want to have an entire semester where everybody feels defensive in their classroom communication. So um, their overall conclusion, which I think is a very key one, is that every teacher must find an effective teaching style that fits his or her personality. Um, but I would also caution that it takes into consideration what we know about students and the teaching learning process. So it's not just finding who you are. You know, you have to take into consideration um, other elements such as, um, well, such as your students themselves, um, the parameters in which, uh, you know, the parameters that guide your teaching, um, any, um, you know, any other departmental um, or university rules or philosophies that you have to follow, things like that. Um, and then the fourth, um, which, which, and the fourth, um, I guess, response, um, I've taken from an article written by Worley, Titsworth, Worley, and Cornette DeVito. Um, published in 2007 in um, Communication Studies. Oh, and let me say too, th these articles I've mentioned so far, a couple of them are on the rec are on the readings list, and then a couple are those that you might want to go back and read. Um, so I'm just giving the highlights of these. I'd encourage you to go back and look at them if you're interested. Particularly, I think Kramer and Peer and this Worley, Titsworth, Worley, and Cornette DeVito article. They um, in this article they were trying to Get to develop a sense of um, instructional communication competence. You know, you know, what is a competent instructor in terms of their communication behavior, basically? Um, and they give a nice long definition, which I will not go into at the moment. But basically, what they did with this piece is they interviewed award-winning teachers from central states. Um, from the Central States Communication Association, who awards an outstanding teacher award um, yearly. Um, and there's parameters on, you know, the guidelines for that, which I don't recall those offhand, because they may, you know, they may change over the years. But the bottom line was they found that competent communication structures have two sets of skills that they rely on. And, um, and, and they call these two starts, one set's called the hard skills, one set is called soft skills. Now, the hard skills sometimes are the things that we don't learn about as college instructors, especially or particularly even because our PhDs are in communication. So the hard skills would be things such as knowing the discipline, knowing your content, you know, beyond what's in the textbook, um, having a sense of, of having a knowledge of teaching pedagogy, which, again, a lot of us don't get in our PhD training. So we don't learn how to teach. We don't learn how to write exams. We don't learn how to create learning objectives. These are things we learn over time or we learn when we start working. Um, this would also be learning how to respond appropriately to students. Um, you know, sometimes we get stuck in, well, we get stuck in a rut when, when we wanna deal with our students. You know, we assume they're all adults. We assume that we shouldn't have to meet many of their needs. Um, in the college classroom, things like that. And, and unfortunately, well, that's not true. Um, it's not, or not possible always. Um, you know, but learning how to become flexible when interacting with students is sometimes difficult for us uh, because we're not aware of how we're coming across or we're not aware of how possibly rigid we are sometimes.
Now, the soft skills then um, were the opposite in terms of the pedagogy. It was really the communication behaviors that we need to use. Um, in the particular article, they mentioned several specific verbal and nonverbal behaviors. One of them is immediacy. We'll talk about immediacy on Thursday, um, which is important to a lot of students. May not be as important to you because you don't think about it, but it is to our students. Um, soft skill would be the motivation to teach. You know, I, you know, I think most of us probably are in this occupation because we like to teach. Not everyone, of course, you know. Um, I got my PhD in communication studies because I wanted to be a college professor. I wanted to teach at the college level. I wasn't looking to become um, a researcher necessarily or even, con in, in, you know, or even know what, or, or uh, engage in a lost service because I wasn't even sure what the service entailed. But I knew I wanted to teach. And that motivation is, was there from day one. That doesn't mean I always did the best job, right? But it was there and um, was something that was important. And so the soft skills, you know, is that motivation to teach, being able to use, recognize and use effective interpersonal, um, I'm sorry, effective instructional behaviors, but also being able to speak or develop interpersonal relationships with your students. And when we talk about interpersonal relationships, we're not talking about things um, like, it, we're not talking about highly intimate relationships. We're not talking about the relational side of things. We're talking about the effective dyadic behaviors that any two people would use when they're communicating with each other. Um, and they also talk about how physical space, this is actually kind of interesting given um, our move to online learning for so many of us or online teaching, is that the physical space really is not as important um, as the psychological space, or we could even say the communication space. Um, you know, creating an atmosphere of acceptance, the freedom to be independent, creating affect, in our interactions with our students for both the learning and our, and our relationships. All right, so that kind of sums up this notion of teaching effectiveness. So the idea here is when you think about what it means to be an effective teacher, um, there are four ways to kind of answer that question. You can say, okay, well, teaching effectiveness is fundamentally related to student learning. Okay, not a bad answer and probably actually one of the better answers. The second one is that, oh, well, it's my in-class behaviors are going to positively affect student outcomes or how students perceive me. And again, not a bad way to look at teaching effectiveness. The third way is more micro and um, identifying particular behaviors that we should use in the classroom. Uh, I didn't go over the 10 in the small and the 8 in the large that Kramer and Peer identified because you can go back and read those. Um, but there, you know, there were four common behaviors between the two classes, but then there were some differences between small and large. So the answer here is that perhaps teaching effectiveness depends on the size of our class because we know it relates, you know, we, we know it can affect whether students participate and whether they're engaged. Um, but, you know, our behaviors will should should be reflective of that class size as well and um, as someone who's taught large lectures classes for years um, you know there are certain behaviors that work better in that large lecture class than in the small and simply because of this class size so that's a way to look at the third response and then the fourth one is to consider um, effective teaching as being um, a combination of hard and soft skills um, and that if we have not learned these hard and soft skills, then we need to start to learn them. All right, so that is our first part of what does it mean to be an effective teacher. Like I said, you can reflect on those four. You could create your own answer. There are actually, I will just say, those are just four ways of looking at it. Um, there are other um, ideas of what it means to be an effective teacher and that are available in the instructional communication literature. There's a body of literature on, it's not huge, but it's a nice size on, on teacher misbehavior. And so these would be behaviors that impede student learning. So it'd be kind of, um, I guess, an ancillary to the Scott Nussbaum um, position. But the bottom line here is that when you think about what it means to be an effective teacher, you need to think about that before you start teaching. Um, and I think as we get to go back in the fall, many of us are hopefully going back to face to face. Others, of us, uh, I guess, are not. I mean, I've been reading um, and hearing, you know, different institutions um, identifying their plan for the fall. 
either way, you know, you have to have a sense of what it means for you to be an effective instructor, because that's going to guide really everything you do. Um, when we talk about things on Thursday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in particular, your effectiveness as a teacher is going to then guide um, your choice of how you communicate with your students and the behaviors you choose to use in the classroom. All right, so we're gonna shift gears slightly because we just have a few minutes left um, and talk about what I wanted to talk just briefly there are a couple of things that inform your teaching effectiveness. So, you know, again, um, we're not all trained in this from the get-go. Now, some of us have been, and, and that's great. Others have not. And then sometimes we forget about these things as we go along with teaching. Um, but one thing I think that is important to think about, um, and, I, and I always talk about this when I'm training my GTAs, when we teach, um, when I teach our teaching practicum for our doc students, um, is you have to think about what is your function in the classroom? What do you, in your mind, what is the primary function that you think uh, you should be fulfilling? There's a wonderful chapter by Kathleen Galvin. It's in an, it's, it's in an older book now um, from 1999. Um, I have a list of suggested resources on the, on the list that I provide to NCA. And this is um, a book edited by uh, Evangelisti, Daly, and Friedrich. Um, this chapter came from that. And this is also one of the readings I'm suggesting you look at. In this chapter, Kathy Galvin talks just a bunch about a bunch of different things that we need to think about as teachers. But one that I think is really important is that she says that there are five role functions that instructors play. And I think you have to stop and think about when you read these five, which one um, or two, but probably just one, really, um, really pulls at you. And again, there's no right or wrong reason for the role function that you should, that you think is your is what you should be doing. But what happened? But what happens then is that um, this function guides a lot of what you do, and you may not consciously be thinking about it as you're doing it. Um, and again, no right or wrong answer. Um, but so she gives five role functions. They start on page 248. Um, I'm just going to read them to you and mention something. Um, and, and these are things we do. We may do all of these. But like I said, most of us are going to gravitate toward one, and that makes sense. Um, and and there, again, there's nothing wrong with, with the one you choose, but it is gonna be reflected in a lot of things that you do in the classroom. Um, so you may have to sometimes backtrack and think about why am I here? And that's something I think we forget sometimes. And sometimes we don't know why we're here. Um, the first role function, these are no particular order, is just providing content expertise. All right, we all know we have to do this, right? But that requires us to stay relevant with our content and it requires us to stay up to date. And, you know, sometimes we know that just becomes a chore, it becomes a problem, and it should not. Um, but we all have a lot of things to do at work, and sometimes this is one that uh, kind of gets lost in the, in the mix. The second role function is providing evaluation feedback. Now, you know, I, I know a lot of us, especially those who have been teaching for a while, have noticed that, you know, students may not seem as interested in feedback as they once were, um, or if they ever really were. But they're much more interested in just the grade. We all can tell stories of how we spent, you know, a lot of time writing comments down and students bypass those. I get that point. But we have to recognize and realize still that's one of our functions. We have to provide our students with some sort of feedback. And as most of us are familiar, there's summative and formative feedback. You know, summative is as we go along. Um, I'm sorry, formative is as we go along. Summative is when we're done. Um, you know, sometimes the amount of feedback we provide is dependent on um, the, the, the assignment, the point value, the significance. You know, a, a two-point in-class activity isn't, doesn't require a lot of feedback versus a five-page, 20% paper, all right? But we have to remember that, that we have to do that. That's part of our job. We also have to keep in mind that we sometimes have to also then engage in our own reflection um, and self-evaluation of what we're doing and how, we, how we're doing it. Um, you know, when you leave the classroom, on your walk back to your office, maybe think about how it went, what you would do differently next time, um, and so forth. Uh, the third one is providing socialization. 
um, kind of interesting, not only providing socialization, you not only into our discipline, you know, those of us who teach the intro classes when students first come to the major, sometimes we have to work harder at that because we want to persuade students that this is something we want them to do or to adopt. Um, it's also an introduction to the world, you know. Um, a lot of us like to consider, you know, talking to our students about going into the, you know, once they go into the real world. And, uh, you know, of course, that's how you define it. You could argue that college is their real world. Um, and some of the stuff may or may not carry over, but bottom line is providing socialization is, is one of our role functions. Um, providing learning management. And this is just referring to the methods and strategies that you use to teach. You know, there's a lot of different ways to teach. Most of us teach in ways that we're comfortable. Um, we have to be careful, though, that we don't get into a rut with those, obviously. Um, you know, but, and, 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 you know, this would include things as lecturing, discussions, small groups, and, you know, those are all easier said than done. There's an art and a science to being a good lecturer. Good discussion questions are hard to write. Assigning a group activity that actually requires group work rather than one person doing all the, doing one person doing it, that is diff can be difficult to do. And then finally, providing role models. Um, you know, and, and you know, some, some instructors take this role function very, or this role function very personally. Uh, they want to represent and illustrate to their students that, you know, um, that they too can, can succeed, you know, um, or that we have a particular way of looking at life and um, we think that that's important to share with our students. So again, role functions. That's what Kathy Galvin talks about in her book chapter. So if you go back and read it, just think about, there's other things in the chapter that are wonderful too, but just think about what role functions do you play in the classroom or what's your most important. Um, the next thing that informs your teaching effectiveness is a teaching philosophy. And we are running out of time, so I will uh, not talk too, too much longer here. You're all familiar with the term teaching philosophy. You may have had to write one at some point, um, or you may have had to articulate it. Um, I, I noticed in the last few years in job ads, I, I've seen a, a growing increase on um, a teaching philosophy as being part of a job applicant packet, which I thought was kind of interesting. Well, there's a couple of different ways to go look at this because um, a teaching philosophy is just not a bunch of behaviors that you use in the classroom. You really have to think about what is your philosophy that guides everything you do in the classroom. And um, I think there are, two, you, there are two neat ways of doing this, and there are others, but these are two that I like and two that I have used over the years. In your readings, there's an article by Briggs and Panola, um, and there's a quiz you can take in there to help you decide on what they call your educational philosophy. And so here, look, I have a nice visual aid. Isn't this cool? In the article, they talk about five different types of educational philosophies, and there's a quiz you can take um, that can help you identify it. The nice thing about this is this really helps you cement your purpose for being in the classroom. Um, and it's through your philosophy that everything else emerges. So your use of particular behaviors, um, your learning management, uh, you know, methods and strategies, the ways in which you um, increase student relevance, those all stem from your philosophy, your what they call an educational philosophy. So this is one way to identify where you're coming from, especially when you first start teaching because you're not necessarily sure, you may not even know necessarily why you're in the classroom you know, aside from it being part of your assistantship, part of it because you're just excited to be there. Um, but when you get a handle on why you're there, this really does inform your teaching effectiveness. And then in the reading, there's an article by Pratt, um, who has developed this notion, you might have heard of, of him. He's developed this notion of five different perspectives. And here we go, if I could learn how to, there we go, five different perspectives the transmissive, developmental, apprenticeship, nurturing, and self-reform. And he has um, a quiz you can take on his website, which I've included in the homework assignment. And again, this gives you a nice way of um, arriving at what you think your philosophy is. You know, so um, when I teach my pedagogy classes, I talk about these things. The Briggs and Panola, I have taken this survey off and on 
This is the, it's going to be Briggs and Petola 1985. I've taken this off and on since I started teaching, and I have pretty much been an experimentalist the entire time, which explains when I look back at my assignments and, and, and the, the way I teach, it makes perfect sense. When I became familiar with this, um, I'm a transmissive. My, my teaching perspective is transmissive and, and apprenticeship. And again, it explains why I do what I do in the classroom. Um, and the nice things about both of these is this, this en enables you just to articulate who you are. And then ultimately what it comes back to then is how are you as an effective teacher? So if I consider teaching effectiveness to be, um, let's see, I want to use the right language. We'll go right back. You know, if I, if I go back to Scott Nussbaum, I, if I say my teaching effectiveness is fundamentally related to student affective, cognitive, and behavioral learning, um, I can stop and think about, okay, now how is that coming through then with my transmissive perspective and then my experimentalist um, educational philosophy? And I can tell you, having written a teaching philosophy several years ago for, for some event, um, it was rather easy to do. Um, rather than think about, oh, I like to be immediate and I really try to be clear. Those are behaviors that illustrate a philosophy. They're not the philosophy itself. Um, all right, so since we're coming to a close, like I said, today's topic was developing um, a sense of teaching effectiveness. So my goal in this short lesson or discussion was to just have you think a bit about what is teaching effectiveness and then to think about how role functions and your teaching philosophy inform the teaching effectiveness. All this stuff works together beautifully. Um, and as I've said before, you know, when you have a sense of why you're there and what you want to do, then you're going to have a good, effective classroom. You're going to have students who want to be there. You're going to have students who want to learn. You're going to have less student problems. You know, I mean. If, you're, if, if you understand what you're doing, you articulate it well to your students and they reduce their uncertainty and they feel comforted and they feel secure. And those are key things. All right, so that's our Monday. Um, I enjoyed um, talking with you, if you want to call it talking. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. If you um, need an additional one of those additional asterisk readings, email me and I can send that to you as well. All right, I will see you tomorrow um, where our topic is teaching from the student perspective. Whoops.